Welcome to the History of European Theatre podcast and thanks for joining me on this journey through millennia of theatrical history. Episode 58, The Castle of Perseverance. Last time, I gave an overview of the morality play and discussed its place in the development of later middle Age theatre. The Castle of Perseverance is the oldest complete morality play from the period and a fine example of how much effort was put into these productions. There has been lots of discussion over the years about how this play was presented and, in particular, what we can take from an illustration of the playing area that's included in the single surviving manuscript that's available to us. As I mentioned last time, the interpretation of this drawing has led to much discussion, some of it quite heated, about the nature of the drawing, or should we say design or sketch, and the implications that it has on the manner of the production of the play. The Castle of Perseverance is a great example of how difficult it can be to discuss the form of a play separately from its content. So before looking at the form and the staging in more detail, I'm just going to sketch in how it is likely that the play was presented, which I think makes the content easier to follow. There are no hard and fast answers here, so all of what follows is no more than a likely interpretation. There are lots of maybes and perhapses, and most of this is highly speculative and based on this one drawing, artistic works from the same period, and the applied knowledge of practitioners who have thought about the problems of staging the play in relation to that illustration, and in a few cases have actually tried it. We have to imagine an open field with a large circular area marked out. Around this a ditch has been dug, and may be filled with water. A bridge or a section of ditch that hasn't been excavated is used to allow the cast and audience to enter. Maybe there's some fencing to ensure that the audience could be funnelled into an entrance point and the attendance fee collected. At the cardinal points of the compass and looking inwards from the ditch, scaffolds have been erected. These are the domains of the major personified characters. In the centre of the enclosed circle that the scaffolds fencing and ditch create, there is a representation of a castle perhaps just a crenellated tower. This stands on legs, so that there is an acting space underneath it. The audience may have used seating inside or outside of the ditch, between the scaffolds, and perhaps they also spilled onto the inner circular area too, sitting on the ground. Maybe they follow the action, moving from the vicinity of one scaffold to another. The shape implies that performances were in the round, but we actually have no documentary evidence to support that view. So, just an idea of how this might have been organised. We'll come back to that after a look at the content of the play. The manuscript of the play opens with the bands announcing the performance in one week's time. It's clearly meant as an advertisement for the forthcoming production, but leaves some intriguing uncertainties. In three places, there are blanks left to enable the inserting of the name of a town. Here's one example. We propose us to play this day, a week before you, in sight, at insert name of town here, on the green in the Royal Array. Now immediately, that suggests that this was a touring production, supporting the belief that touring troops were becoming common at this time. But as we'll see, this production is a big undertaking, and it seems far more likely that it would have been staged in a fixed location, with people from a wide catchment area travelling to come to see it. Perhaps there were travelling performances at different sites, but on a large scale, so the move of set and props and the company was made on an infrequent basis, settling in at one site for some weeks at a time. The plan that we will look at does allow for some variations in the setup of the acting and audience area, so again, perhaps this is allowing for the topography of different locations. There are also some variations in the detail mentioned in the bands and the text of the play. In the bands, the character of conscience is mentioned but doesn't appear in the play. Also, they mention the intercession of the Virgin Mary at the end of the play, but in the manuscript, this is undertaken by characters called the Four Daughters of God. The most likely reason for this is that the play went through revisions that were not reflected in the bands, or at least in the version of the bands that were added to the manuscript that we have. The play opens with the characters of the world, the flesh and the devil giving boastful speeches. Although given by allegorical characters, they're the type of speech that were familiar to the audience from characters like Herod and the Pharaoh in the cycle plays, full of praise for their own greatness and their ability to control men. Each character speaks from his own scaffold, and from there rules over other characters, the seven deadly sins. 
the world introduces his first lieutenant, greed, in the form of covetousness. Covetousness is so important to the battle for men's souls that he is given his own scaffold, placed to one side of the world. Flesh is joined on his scaffold by sloth, lechery and gluttony. The devil on his scaffold is in the company of pride, wrath and envy. God is seated in his own scaffold. With these introductions done, mankind is born. This was acted out by the character of mankind rising from a bed positioned under the legs of the castle. Perhaps the actor had been lying there as the audience arrived, or maybe covered in some way so that his birth could not be anticipated. Otherwise, it's not clear how the actor would have got into position unnoticed by the audience. As he rises, mankind speaks of his ignorance and helplessness and asks for God's grace to assist him through his life. He introduces the two constant companions of his life, the good angel and the bad angel, who are the advisers of all men. Each angel gives a speech on how man should lead a good life and mankind decides to follow the suggestion of the bad angel, opting for a life governed by the pleasures of the world. The bad angel takes mankind to the scaffold of the world and his servants, folly and pleasure, who is referred to as lust-liking in the play, and they dress mankind in fine clothes. Mankind is then assisted by the vice called backbiter to visit greed. Greed calls other characters from the scaffolds owned by the devil and the flesh, and they all gather at the scaffold, helping mankind onto it, where he settles down, sitting next to greed. The good angel is concerned by these developments and calls on confession and penitence to persuade mankind to leave greed. He is reluctant until penitence pricks him with a sharp lance. As mankind is persuaded to leave greed's sphere of influence, the good angel invites him to come and live in the castle of perseverance, where the cardinal virtues will protect him. Mankind enters the castle. He is accompanied by humility, abstinence, chastity, charity, patience, generosity and industry. But he's not safe yet. Backbiter is intent on making trouble, and he argues with the world, the flesh and the devil that they should punish their followers for letting mankind slip away from their influence. He gathers them all, and together they lay siege to the castle. Each vice battles it out with their opposite virtue. This is a prolonged physical staged fight. At one point, the stage direction indicates that the devil joins in, accompanied by pyrotechnics. Eventually, the vices are defeated, with a shower of red roses ejected from the castle. But still, mankind isn't safe. As the battle has progressed, mankind has grown old. And just at the apparent moment of triumph, greed again approaches mankind and suggests that in his old age, some comforts and an easy life would be entirely appropriate. Mankind is tempted away, and to the dismay of the virtues, he follows greed. Before he can really enjoy his newfound lifestyle, death appears and pierces him with a lance. Mankind is dying, and the world sends the young man called I Know Not Who to remove his wealth. Mankind has returned to the bed under the castle that he was born in and puts his soul at the mercy of God as he dies. And at the moment of his death, an actor playing the soul of mankind rises from under the bed and is grabbed by the bad angel to be taken to the devil. As mankind died in a state of sin, the good angel is powerless to help his soul. But there is a final moment of hope. Truth Justice, peace and mercy, the four daughters of God, appear in front of the scaffold occupied by God, and there they lay out the case for and against the salvation of mankind. Truth and knowledge acknowledge mankind's deathbed repentance, but say that it is insufficient to save his soul. Mercy and peace argue for mankind, saying his repentance must be added to that of Christ's sacrifice. God agrees with mercy and peace and orders mankind's soul to be taken from the devil's scaffold, removing it from hell, and to bring it to him and to judgment, from where he is taken into heaven. This final act is the embodiment of salvation through God's mercy. In the final lines of the play, the actor playing God steps out of character and asks the audience to think on what they have just seen and draw the proper moral conclusions, that from the very beginning of life, every man should be mindful of his ending. So the message and meaning of the play is quite clear and I don't think it needs any additional commentary. Mankind is constantly at risk from the temptations of the devil in the guise of the seven deadly sins and can be easily led astray, particularly by greed. This fight is illustrated through personification and allegory and is very obvious. 
Perhaps the nice touch here is that the fight for mankind is one only to be lost as old age weakens him and greed can again persuade him from the right path. The red roses that are thrown from the castle and bring about the temporary defeat of the vices represent the passion of Christ. And what an interesting effect that must have been. How many red petals had to be gathered or made to make this work in a large open air setting? As I've already noted, with morality plays, the ending, where mankind is saved by God's grace, is hopeful. But with the message brought home by God stepping out of character and addressing the audience directly. The manuscript we have is probably a copy of an earlier version, and particulars of the dialect used suggest that it was probably written in the early 15th century. Those same dialectic considerations suggest the play was created in the East Midlands of England, probably close to the city of Norfolk. It is the tiniest detail that help in fixing these points. For example, the word Krakows is used in the play in a reference to a particular type of pointed shoe that we know from other sources was popular from the 1380s for a period of about 45 years. 1425 is therefore estimated at the latest possible composition date. Other stylistic differences suggest that the play had two or three authors, but nothing is known about the identity or occupation of any of them. Although the manuscript is referred to as complete, there are in fact two pages missing, so about 100 lines out of 3,500. I have seen estimates of the performance length that vary from about 45 minutes to somewhere close to two hours. That discrepancy seems to originate from the estimates of the time left for movements around the acting area, and in particular, the time taken for the battle between the virtues and the vices. From a dramatic action point of view, this is the centrepiece of the play, and the stage direction does say they fought for a long time. The battle has lines of argument between each vice and virtue, stating their position in relation to the fate of mankind, until the devil urges his followers, the vices, on to the battle, and then each vice and virtue fight. It's not clear if they fight simultaneously, or each pair take it in turn, so this could make a real difference to the runtime of the play. If it is a long period, and that seems a very reasonable assumption, then we also have to assume it was enjoyed by the audience and choreographed and performed well enough to include a sense of jeopardy. And then at the end we have this moment of apparent victory spoilt by greed approaching mankind quietly, which I think is a really clever dramatic moment. The obvious battle seems to end in victory, but the vice wins the day through his insidious and quiet approach. Now we have to address the illustration in the manuscript. It's useful to have it to hand, so I've posted it on the website gallery and put a link to the page in the show notes. I've also used it in the Facebook and Twitter promotions for this episode. But before we go into the detail, I should note that it's orientated with north towards the bottom of the page, the reverse of how the cardinal points of the compass are usually shown in the Northern Hemisphere society. This has led scholars to two possible conclusions, which may not be themselves contradictory. This orientation suggests that this is a sketch or plan of an actual production, either as envisaged by the author or perhaps as it was seen by the scribe who copied the manuscript. Another suggestion is that this is a literal interpretation of the trope of the world turned upside down, letting the audience know that this is not a representation of the lived world, but something closer to the imagined and invisible world of God. The easy bit is the most prominent part, the castle in the centre of the illustration. It's a single tower, with brickwork illustrated on the top part, below crenellations. The sides of the tower, drawn as two shallow arcs, extend below the brickwork, suggesting the tower was on legs, making room below the tower for the bed or bench that's illustrated. There are four labels written above, below and to each side of the castle, and additional notes within the double ring that encloses the castle. The wording above the castle, and I'm paraphrasing all of this into modern English, says this. This is the castle of perseverance that stands in the middle of this place. But let nobody sit there for letting of sight, for there shall be the best of all. The meaning here is not clear. The concern seems to be to keep the space clear so that lines of sights are not disturbed. Does the last part mean that there's some reserved seating for special guests, the best of all? No one has come up with a definitive answer. Below the castle, it says, Mankind's bed will be under the castle, and there shall the soul lay until he rises to play. Which all seems clear enough, so we agree there was space under the castle for the entrance and exit of mankind and his soul, and this was done from the bed. 
To the sides of the castle it says, The cupboard of covetous, by the feet of the bed, shall be at the end of the castle. So a reserved space close to the bed, but not exactly where it is written in the plan. That's about the best we can get from that. Between the two circles that enclose the castle it says, This is the water about the place, if any ditch may be made where it shall be played, or else that it be strongly barred about, and let not over many stitleries be within this place. The role of the stitlery is obscure. It's another point over which many pages have been written, trying to trace the etymology of the word and to define exactly what it meant for a theatre production. I'll cut through that and get to the point that they seem to be people who were in control of the crowd. The implication is to umpire, to marshal, to set in order, to control. So maybe people who knew the play and could marshal the crowd to the best advantage point for the current action if they were using a promenade form. Or maybe they could move a block of people who were disturbing a sight line for others at particular points in the play. Yet what we seem to have here is a plea for not too many stitleries in the area. We either misunderstand the use of the word, or, or maybe it has some further meaning in the specifics of the theatre context. Whoever they were, they're only referred to three times in all of medieval plays that we have, so they are very obscure. The wording outside the circle to the right says, He shall play Belial, and prepare with gunpowder and burning pipes in his hands, in his ears, and in his arse, from where he goes into battle. The four daughters shall be clad in cloaks, mercy in white, righteousness in red all over, truth in sad green, and peace all in black. They shall play this place together, until they bring up the soul. It seems like Belial with the demon was the high point of the show, and quite a spectacle. Good luck to the actor with that one. Five notes beyond the outer circle of the picture are labels relating to the scaffolds, that are the home kingdoms of God, the devil, the world, flesh and greed and their followers. So we have some fixed features to orientate around, the castle, the bed beneath and the ditch. We also have scaffolds, but no suggestion as to what they looked like. What the drawing does not tell us is anything about where the audience sat or stood, except for possibly where they are to be excluded from. The wording about the water-filled ditch, which offers an alternative if the digging of a ditch isn't possible, supports the detail from the bands that suggests this was a touring production and needed to be adapted to local conditions. It's also seen as proof of an attempt to keep control of who could see the play and therefore control the collection of fees and protect the income generated from the performance. The wording related to the scaffolds is outside the ditch, but this could just be a necessity of the space on the diagram, rather than suggesting that they were constructed outside of the ditch. The scaffolds would have provided some degree of shielding from any person standing outside the ditch, and if a fence was being used instead of a ditch, then this too would have prevented sight of the play by those outside to some degree. And what about the effort of digging the ditch? No easy task for an area that contains a playing space and the castle and the audience. That's a lot of digging, and presumably making good on the site after the production had moved on. Now that suggests a degree of forward planning. Whoever the producers of this play were, they must have had to secure permissions to perform the play from the local civic leaders, and then find a suitable site. A sort of getting crew would have been needed to prepare the ground. Perhaps local itinerant workers were employed to dig the ditch. Get enough hands on it, and maybe it could be done in a day or two. But then you have to pay them, and that suggests forward investment in the production, assuming workers didn't dig on the promise of payment once the takings of the production were collected, which seemed unlikely. And what about the spoil from the ditch? Was that taken away, or used to make a bank on one side of the ditch? If so, was the bank on the inside of the ditch, or the outside? Was it used as a vantage point for the audience members to sit on? There has been a lot of paragraphs written on just the positioning of the ditch and the use of the spoil from the dig, its effectiveness and its relationship to the play, and it's not even the most contentious part of the debate about what this illustration does or doesn't tell us. Then the players arrive. Perhaps this is scheduled to coincide with other engagements as they make their way to this particular site. Or maybe the players are part of the crew getting the production in, one site at a time. The cast is unusually large for a morality play, so we assume a core of professional or semi-professional players took the main speaking roles, with local amateurs and extras taking the minor silent parts. 
The players probably only needed a single rehearsal just to check out this particular space, but the extras may have needed more time and a director of some sort to block their moves as part of the preparations. A week after the bands were read to announce the show, the first day of performance arrived. We don't know what time of day performances were given, or how often they were repeated in a day, or any such detail. We're not even sure where the audience was positioned, and this is the most contentious part of the debate about the play. The illustration says that they won't be within the ditch or in a specific area above the castle, but both of these statements have been subject to much speculation. The note on the ditch could be referring to just the non-playing lookers-on. The note above the castle may not refer to the whole area, but just a part of it. We simply don't know. The question of the audience view and sightlines is crucial here, I think. If they were seated in specified areas between the scaffolds or on the ground closer to the action, then at points during the play, some part of the play would have been lost to them. If they moved around and followed the action in a promenade form, how would they have been marshalled and prevented from getting too close to the devil's fireworks or the fighting pairs? Richard Southern, a renowned scholar of theatre history and design, wrote a whole book on the subject of the play and its staging in the 1950s. But although he made many valid individual points, he failed to come up with a persuasive conclusion about the play as a whole. One conclusion that he does draw is that he believed that the audience must have been situated within the ditch or the fence, as the practicalities of setting them outside of this boundary could not be overcome, and he believed they sat on a mound created from the spoil from the ditch. Twenty years later, Glyn Wickham made a far less detailed attempt at an explanation as part of his more general book about medieval theatre, and really takes the earlier work to task over this statement. He bases this criticism on the single fact that he believes Southern failed to to take into account. He points out that one of the most popular entertainments of the time was the tournament, and this play carries many of the attributes of the tournament, both in the language of the play and particularly in the battles where the vices are paired off against the virtues. This, he argues, demands a separation of audience and players that is very well defined and marshalled. He points out that given the meticulous preparations that must have been made to get this play on, it is very unlikely that the very precise rules about where the audience would sit or stand would surely not have been overlooked. Accepting these assumptions also means that we don't have to disbelieve what's written in the notes on the plan. In his version, the scaffolds are set behind, or even on top, of the mound of ditch spoil, and seating placed between them. With steps or boards placed over the ditch, additional raised seating can be provided, and a clear division between actor and audience maintained. Just before he was writing, Bristol University had produced a Cornish cycle play of Noah and the Flood in just this way, which, he says, proves this was a viable assumption. It's a very good argument, but leaves at least two unanswered questions. With much of the play on or around the scaffolds, significant parts of the action would have been invisible or at least inaudible to sections of the audience, and still leaves the problem with sight lines. We don't know how tall the castle in the centre of the action was, but unless it was very squat, then part of the action will always be hidden by it for part of the audience, also making the speech inaudible for them. This assumes the audience were in the round, but as already discussed, perhaps they weren't. If the audience was not in the playing area, then why were the marshals needed, if indeed that's what they were? So many unanswered questions. And I saw one more interesting thought on this debate. We're assuming that medieval man was interested, as we are, in hearing every word of the play and following it in detail. But what if they weren't? This is also a consideration for the cycle plays presented on a wagon. If you were sat near hell... Could you see and hear what was going on in heaven at the other end of the stage, maybe on an adjacent wagon? If you were seated near Greed's scaffold, could you see and hear what God was proclaiming? The cycle play narratives were well known, and the progression of the morality play followed a familiar and predictable path. So, were any unheard or unseen sections even missed that much? Once again, we have to try and understand the medieval sensibilities and mindset to even get close to answering this question, and I would not claim to be anywhere close to that, so I'll just leave the thought hanging. Having spent quite a few hours looking and thinking about this drawing in the manuscript, I'm left feeling very uncertain about it. I think there is one further thing we might take into account. 
Looking at the way the notes read, I think it's possible to conclude that the scribe who was copying them down hadn't seen the play and had little understanding of it. Possibly the notes were copied or dictated without understanding and are therefore incomplete or inaccurate, or at the very least, unhelpful. So there is scope to come to very different conclusions about the staging of the play. However, I have to admit that they might have been perfectly clear to a contemporary reader and we've just lost too much with the passing of time to understand them properly. For all that The Castle of Perseverance is a didactic allegory with a very clear message and serious purpose, I think we should also highlight that it would have been an exciting spectacle for all who attended the performance. The message is never lost, but think of the siege of the castle, the sight of the virtues and vices battling it out on the stage tournament. The rose petals falling from the castle, the devil appearing with pyrotechnic accompaniment and perhaps even the pathos of the death of mankind touching the audience. Whatever the difficulties in the staging, this is good and entertaining theatre. Next time, more morality and Christian salvation, or not, with the story of every man, which we should properly call the summoning of every man. It takes us to the end of the medieval period and the beginning of Tudor period drama in England, although it is in fact an import from Europe. In the meantime, please don't forget to have a look at the illustration of the Castle of Perseverance on the website gallery, that's www.thehistoryofeuropeantheatre.com, and then follow the link to the gallery. I've also put a couple of related illustrations there that you might find interesting to look at and think on. On the website, you can also find all the podcast episodes, suggested reading and some blogging about theatre and history. If you would like to support the podcast, then please post a rating or even a review on Apple Podcasts or go to patreon.com for more content for a small monthly fee. Also, you can join the Facebook group and follow the podcast on Twitter. Any contributions through Patreon or Ko-fi.com go towards offsetting the costs of hosting the podcast and are gratefully received. We're getting towards the end of the medieval season, so if you have any questions stacked up about the period, please do get in touch and I'll do my best to answer them before we come to the close of this part of theatre history. And of course, generally, if you have any questions, comments or concerns, you can always contact me by email on thoetp at gmail.com or via Twitter at thoetp. Thank you.